I'm glad to have you as well. And uh, pray that uh, as we finish up our study of Job tonight, that it would be that it would be a blessing and a challenge and an encouragement uh, for each and every one. So let's turn to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. My mother-in-law, and you know it's dangerous when you start basing theology on what your mother-in-law says. I, you know, that's kind of a dangerous thing. But my, my, my mother-in-law once told me that her favorite words in the Bible, think about it, her favorite words in all of the Bible are the words, it came to pass. It came to pass. When I asked her why that she chose those words as her favorite words, she says, well, obviously, it's because of the fact that nothing comes to stay. Yeah, nothing comes to stay. By the way, that's exactly, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Uh, listen, listen to what the Apostle Paul said. 2 Corinthians and chapter 4, verse number 18. He says, while we look not at. In, in other words, we do not make the focus of our life. We, we do not make the focus of our life the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. And here's the reason why. For the things which are seen are temporal. In other words, they're temporary. They, they don't come to stay. They come to pass, right? Yeah, the, the, the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, those things are eternal. Those things are eternal. And so it's true for the child of God, the things of this life, the happy times and the hard times, the, the, the pleasant circumstances and the crisis circumstances, uh, they're always fluid in our life. They're, they're, they're always fluid and, and, and they can always very quickly change. They can very quickly change. And, and that was certainly true with Job. We've seen in his study how, how he experienced the very best of pleasant circumstances. Remember back in chapter one? Yeah, he experienced the very best of pleasant circumstances, but, but then he very quickly saw all of it turn to crisis circumstances that he could not understand. He couldn't understand the reason for it. Could not understand the reason for it. And as we have studied through this book, we, we've been taking uh, a, a look into the very heart of human suffering. Uh, we, we've been taking a look into the very uh, heart of that, and, it, and and I have to acknowledge it has been a it's been a difficult study. It, it's been a difficult study wading through all of this because, and, and actually that makes sense because of the fact that there's nothing easy about suffering. Have you noticed that? Yeah, there's nothing easy about suffering, and, and suffering typically becomes it becomes harder, and, and it will always last longer than we want it to. It, it doesn't go away as quickly as we would desire. But but remember the words, remember the words uh, of that famous theologian, my mother-in-law, it came to pass. Yeah, it, it came to pass. Now you remember over the past couple of weeks, we have seen in chapter 38 to chapter 41, we've seen how that the Lord God began talking with Job. And, uh, and we saw how that the Lord God humbled Job. He, he broke Job's pride. He broke Job's pride by showing him two things. First of all, he showed Job that he was not as smart as the Lord God. He, he's not as smart as God. He doesn't know everything God knows. And, and then he also, he also humbled Job by showing him that he was not as powerful as the Lord God. He's not as powerful as God is. Well, but now we come to the final chapter. We come to the final chapter, and here Job is going, he, he's going to, actually, he's going to learn something more about the Lord God. In fact, in fact, notice with me, if you would, very quickly, in, in uh, James chapter 5, James is going to talk about Job. Here's what he says. He says, take my brethren, the prophets, 
who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of glorious victories. No, that's not what it says, is it? No, he, 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 says, he says, take for an example the example of suffering affliction. Suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Uh, and all of his suffering, yet God is going to show pity on Job. He's going to be merciful to Job. Bottom line, Job is going to learn that when the Lord God allows pain, when he allows suffering, when he brings chastisement into our lives, it is never an act of anger, nor is it an act of vengeance. He's not trying to get even with us, not trying to get even with us. Rather, it is out of a loving heart that desires the very best for us. That, that's the purpose behind it. That's the purpose behind it. So in this final chapter, we're going to see that Job's story is actually going to end very well. His story is going to end well. We're going to see three things that the Lord God accomplished in the life of Job in this last chapter. So let's notice number one, we're going to see Job's sanctification, his sanctification. After hearing the words of the Lord God, in, in chapter 38, 39, 40, 41, uh, we quickly noted how that Job acknowledged the, in, the omnipotence of God. He, he acknowledged God's omnipotence in Job 42, verse, verse 1 and verse 2. But, but then as a result of that, we, we, we see some other things that were, that were taking place. First of all, we see, we see his humility. We see Job's humility now. Uh, before, he was constantly arguing. He's constantly defending himself. He's constantly claiming, I have not done anything wrong. See, that was just pride talking. That was his pride showing itself. But but now he has been humbled. And, and, and so notice in verse number three, we, we see the humility of Job. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Uh, Job's heart was convinced that he could tell God how things ought to be. But, but to do so would be to act without knowledge. It would be to act without understanding. Therefore, Job says, have I uttered that that I didn't even understand it? In other words, I started running off at the mouth, and I didn't even know what I was talking about. You ever done that? Boy, I have. Uh, and then Ginger always sets me straight, okay? But, uh, but, but yeah, yeah it's, it's easy to do, isn't it? We start talking about things, and we have our opinions, and really the truth is we don't know what we're talking about. That's what Job is saying. That's what Job said. He, he said, I've uttered things that I didn't understand. Far, not only that, I've uttered things too wonderful for me. In other words, I've been way over my own head. I, I've been in deep water and, and couldn't swim. I, I, I've uttered things that were too wonderful for me, things which I knew not. Things which I knew not. He, and so we see he expresses his humility. And, and then following his admission uh, that he was now humbled, we now see also his request. His request, verse number four, here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Uh, in other words, he wants God now to talk to him. He wants God to, to explain some things to him. And, and he's going to ask that God would declare to him that which he needs to hear. And, and it's going to be based on the fact of, let her see, his repentance his repentance. You remember in Psalm 44, verse number 21, Psalm 44, verse 21, the psalmist said, he, talking about the Lord God, he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knows the secrets of the heart. And, and in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, uh, God himself said this, God said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways. And the Lord God had certainly known what was in the heart of Job. 
God knew exactly what was in Job, even though Job wasn't aware of it in the beginning. Uh, God knew what was there. By the way, God knows what's in your heart, too. He, he knows what it is that motivates you. He, he tries the reins. He knows what is in our heart. Uh, God knows our heart. And, and so, therefore, uh, I think one writer said it very well. Here's what he noted. He said, even though it took quite a bit to bring Job's pride to the forefront, the Lord God knew it was there all the time. He knew it was there all the time. So after Job came to see as the Lord God saw him, he comes to see himself in his, in his ignorance and in his weakness. Uh, he comes to see himself as, as, as one who is, who, is, who is proud, who has been saying things he should not have been saying. He, he's been thinking of things that he should not have been thinking. And, and, and now he wants God to deal with him. And, and so Job now, he comes to see himself as the Lord God saw him. And, and, and here's, here's what he says. Notice his repentant heart. Verse 5 and verse 6, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Not I haven't seen your person, but I've seen so clearly illustrated your wisdom. I've seen so clearly illustrated your awesome power. I, I, I've seen how you've worked in my life. Didn't see it before, but now I see it. Now, now I can see what you've been doing. I can see why you've been doing it. Wherefore, because of what I have seen, result of it is I abhor myself. I abhor myself and I repent in dust and in ashes. Abject humility on display. He's repenting now. No more pride, no more defending himself, no Here's how it is, and I hate myself for it. I hate myself for it. I hate that I have done this, and, and I repent. I repent in dust and ashes. This place of humility, this place of repentance, this is exactly what the Lord God had designed all of Job's sufferings to accomplish. This is the very thing that the Lord God knew and desired to see happen when he said to Satan, yeah, you can take all of his stuff. You can touch his body. You can't take his life, but you can totally take away everything else. So you see, God knew all along exactly what his plan and purpose was in that. And it was in order that Job might be humbled, that he might be humbled. In other words, the Lord God desired was that when he was done with Job, when he was done with him, Job would be even more pure than he ever had been before. He would be more holy. He would be more, more sanctified and set apart to serving God with all of his heart. Now, now you remember we saw in the beginning, back in chapter one, verse number one, the very beginning, we saw that concerning Job, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man, that man, more than any other man, think about that, more than any other man, that man was perfect. And he was upright and one that feared God and he eschewed evil. He, he hated evil. Now, the reason I mention that is because I want you to understand something that we find very clearly pointed out in this 42nd chapter. And that is this. God is not interested in us being the most holy people in town. God is not interested in us being the most holy people in town because when we begin to think that we're going to be the most holy people in town, you know what that means? That means we start comparing ourselves with the people in town. And when we're better than they are, then we feel like we have really accomplished something. That's not God's desire. No, God does not want us to measure ourselves by other people. God wants us to be measured by his measuring stick. He wants us to be measured by his measuring rod. In other words, he wants to stand, wants us to stand. You remember when you were a kid? I, I, maybe, maybe your mom and dad did this. I, I, I know we had a door in our house. 
And uh, and there was uh, we we would line up there in front of the door of jam, you know, and they would mark a little mark, you know, and that's how tall we were, you know. And then we grew a little bit, and then they would mark another mark, maybe every year or something like that, you know. And, uh, and and so and so we we were measuring that way. And then I remember when my sisters came along, they always wanted to be measured by my mark. You know, they, they, they couldn't wait for the day they could pass my mark, you know. And, but, you know, no, that's not how we should measure ourselves. We need to stand, we need to stand by the measuring rod of God's holiness. We need to stand by the measuring rod of God's goodness and his righteousness. And, and we need to measure ourselves by that. We don't measure ourselves by one another. Yeah, Job was the most holy man in town. But guess what? Job had a big problem. And God had to deal with that. God had to deal with that. Because you see, the Bible gives us a very clear statement. Here's what Jesus said about this. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 48. He said, be ye therefore better than Brother Tocklet. <laughs> that's in the original Greek. <laughs> no, that's not what it says, is it? No, he, he said, you be perfect. How perfect? How perfect? Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That's the measuring rod right there. That's the measuring rod. And the way that becomes a reality, the, the, the way God works that in us. Are you ready for this? Peter tells us about it. First Peter chapter five, verse number 10, Peter said, but the great, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Now notice these next few words. After that you suffered a while. Oh, we don't like to hear about that. But it's in the book, isn't it? After we have suffered a while, he makes you perfect to establish, strengthen, settle you. See, that's how God works in our lives. He, he wants us to be holy. He wants us to be sanctified. And, and the way he works that is bringing us to a point where we recognize all of our foolishness, all of our sinfulness, all of our pride, all of our rebellion. And when he knocks all of that out of us through suffering, then we can begin to be what he desires for us to be. Bottom line, the purpose of suffering is so that we might more and more be conformed to the image, and to the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Job's suffering, it ended. It ended with his sanctification. It ends with his sanctification. But then we also find another thing in this final chapter. Not only do we see Job's sanctification, number two, we see Job's vindication. His vindication. In, in, in Psalm 31, in Psalm 31, the psalmist said this, verse 22, verse number 23, for I said in my haste, in other words, I was talking without thinking, okay? I, I'm talking, I'm putting my mouth in gear before I put my brain in gear. I, I'm speaking hastily here. I, I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Now, Job basically had rushed to the same conclusion, remember? Job, Job thought God had forsaken him. Job, Job thought that God had turned his back on him. So, so Job came to the same conclusion the psalmist did. He came to the same conclusion. I'm cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. So after dealing with Job, the Lord God, as the psalmist said, now he's going to focus his attention on those proud doers. 
He's going to focus his attention on, on, on those three friends who had added to Job's affliction uh, with their pride and with their arrogant and with their know-it-all attitude. Uh, those statements they made concerning how they totally understood uh, the ways of God and the works of God and the judgments of God. They, they had all of the answers that Job needed in their own mind. They believed that to be true. But then we find now God is going to speak concerning those friends. And, and there's a couple of things that we find. First of all, there is a condemnation. And we mentioned it before, if you'll remember, over in verse number seven, Job 42, verse number seven. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee. And against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. These fellows thought they had all the answers. They thought they knew exactly how God operated. They, they thought they perfectly understood the ways of God. And, and, and God says, no, no, you, you, you had it all wrong. You had it all wrong. And so there's there's the condemnation. And then we see also this letter B. There, there's the command that is given. And, and Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 15. Proverbs 24, verse 15. Lay not wait. That simply means don't, don't set up an ambush. Don't, don't set up an ambush. Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. In other words, the warning is to the wicked man not to ambush the righteous man and, and, and to destroy his, his peace of mind, his, his, his joy, his happiness. Uh, don't, don't do that. But that's exactly what Job's three friends had done. With all of their criticism, with all of their false accusations, Job's three friends had done exactly that. And, and so here's what the Lord God now is going to command. He's going to give them a command to do this. Verse number eight. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job. Remember I told you before, when you're, when you're talking with people, you need to make your words soft because you may have to eat them. They may come back to you. Yeah, that's exactly what is happening here. God said, okay, fellas, you thought you knew so much. You ambushed Job. You, you brought all these false accusations with no evidence. You, you've done all, okay, now you go to Job. You go to Job. And offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. Boy, that's tough. But it doesn't end there. By the way, when you go to Job and bring your offering, don't forget to do this. Ask Job to pray for you. Ask Job to pray for you. For him, him will I accept. God said, I'll listen to Job. I'll accept Job lest I deal with you after your folly in that ye have spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. Wow. Okay, guys, you thought you knew everything. You condemned a righteous man without any cause. You condemned a man without any reasons. Now you go to that man. And not only do you go to him, you apologize to him and ask him to pray for you. Now, <clears throat> let me just tell you, it is at this point, Job would have to be very careful. It's at this point, Job would have to be very careful because here's what the wise man said. The wise man said in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17 and verse number 18, rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Why? Here's the reason. Lest the Lord see it. Lest the Lord see it. And it displease him. It displeases God. And he, that's God, turns away his wrath from him, from your enemy. And yet how many times when, uh, 
you know, somebody does us wrong and then God, God kind of changes things around and we are vindicated and their wrong is proven and we go, oh yeah, get him again. Yeah, you know that, you know. I, I know y'all are too spiritual. You wouldn't ever think like that. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's kind of human nature, isn't it? Have to be careful. Have to be careful. Because you see, when we begin to rejoice at God's chastisements on our enemies, what happens is God takes the chastisement, he moves it from our enemy, and he brings it back to us. So Job had to be careful here. He had to be careful. Which then brings us to, let us see, the conclusion. Verse number nine. We find the conclusion of all this. It says, so Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. They go to Job. They acknowledge they're wrong. They apologize for the hurt that they have done to him. And then the Bible says, and the Lord also accepted Job. Huh. The, these guys went and apologized, and God accepted Job. What, what, what does that mean? What that means is simply this. When these men did what the Lord God commanded them to do, and when Job prayed for them, God accepted Job's prayer. God answered his prayer for those friends who had hurt him and who had who had shamefully, shamefully treated him. Now, while in this life, we need to know that we are going to face times when God is going to allow us to face crisis circumstances. And we've mentioned this many times as we've come through these chapters together over the past been 25 weeks now that we've been going through the book of Job. And so there are times God's going to allow us to face times of crisis circumstances. But, but during those times, there are going to be some who are going to sit in judgment. There's going to be some who will say, well, we're getting what we deserve. They're, they're going to find fault. They're going to point the finger of blame. And, and, and in other words, what is going to happen, it's going to be the same kind of thing that the psalmist spoke of in Psalm 44, verse number 13, when he said, thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are around about us. But just as there was for Job, there will come a day of vindication. There will come a day of vindication. Those who have judged us, those who have condemned us, will also see what God was doing in our lives. And as a result, in Psalm 58, verse number 11, so that a man shall say, so that a man shall say, verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Job thought God had forsaken him, but guess what? No, God had not forsaken him. There, there is a reward for being righteous. There, there is a reward for doing right, and God is the judge who will judge in this earth. He, he, will, he will do that. So Job's ended. His suffering ended with, with his sanctification. It ended with his vindication. And then we also see it ended with his restoration. It ends with his restoration. In, in chapter 42, verse number 10, the Bible says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. That simply means he, he did a 180 degree turnaround in Job's circumstances. He, he turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, now I want you to notice in this verse, there's an important point. We must not overlook it. And that is this, the restoration of Job came after, pay attention, Job's restoration came after he obeyed God's command to pray for those who had attacked him. God's restoration for Job, God's blessings to Job did not come until after Job had obeyed 
and, 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 and done what God commanded him to do. Those friends who had proved to be worthless and miserable comforters for him. Uh, Job was to pray for them. But until he did that, God could never bless him. God could never restore to him. And I dare say that many times as God's people, perhaps we miss God's blessings simply because we fail to obey the words of the Lord Jesus when he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 44, I say unto you, love your enemies. Boy, that's easy to read, but it's hard to live, isn't it? Yeah, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Uh, do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. They take unfair advantage of you. Pray for them. Not pray they'll die. <laughs> okay. But, but, but pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. And because Job obeyed the command of the Lord, he, he did pray for his, those friends. He, he did pray for those who had hurt him and those who had abused him in so many ways. Because he did that, God blessed him. And we find that he is now restored. And this restoration comes in several ways. First of all, we find that because he obeyed the command of the Lord God, God blessed him with the restoration of his relationships the restoration of his relationships. Notice it in verse number 11. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been his acquaintances, that is his, his neighbors, his, his associates, his colleagues, all of those that he has known before. Before, they didn't want to have anything to do with him because he had gone from the top to the bottom, remember? He had gone from riches to rags. Everybody separated from him. But, but now they all come to him. They come to him as they had done before and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him. In other words, they look upon him now. Instead of looking on him with contempt, now they look on him with pity. Now they look on him with compassion, and they comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. In other words, they came to renew that relationship with Job that was broken when he had fallen into that time of crisis circumstances. All all those relationships that were broken, that were lost, now they're all restored. Now they're all restored. And so because Job obeyed God, there was the restoration of his relationships. Not only that, there's the restoration of his wealth. The restoration of his wealth, as would have been proper and fitting in that culture. When all of those acquaintances came to visit with Job because because of the standing that he had once had and because of the position that he had once held, it would have been, it would have been common protocol to come to the, such a one and to bring a gift. It, that would have been the normal thing to do. And, and so when all of these people come, they come bringing a gift. What is the gift? Look at it in verse number 11, the last part of the verse. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. Not only are the relationships restored, but now these relationships are beginning to bring gifts to him. They're, they're, they're beginning to bring money to him. And, and as a result of those gifts that are brought to him, verse number 12 tells us that the Lord blessed the latter end of Job, that simply means the end of the story, okay? God blessed the end of the story of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she-asses. By the way, if you'll take that verse right there, you go back and you compare it with Job chapter 1, verse 3, you'll find that God perfectly doubled everything that Job had lost. Everything that Job had lost, everything that was taken away, God gave him back double. Gave him back double what had been lost. 
gave him back double from what he had had before. So there's the restoration, the restoration of relationships, the restoration of his wealth. And, and then there's also the restoration of his children. Verse number 13 says, he also had, or he had also seven sons and three daughters. Now, this is an interesting thing because while everything else that Job lost was doubled, the number of children was not doubled. If you go back to chapter one, verse uh, verse number two, he had 10 children before. Now he has 10 children again. Okay, they're not double. He didn't have 20 children. That was God's mercy on Mrs. Joe. <laughs> Ladies want to say amen? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, no, no, I'm just kidding. But but God did not restore, God, God did not double that. He, he did not double that. Uh, those those kids who died in the storm in, in chapter one, verse 18, verse 19, see, God did not double that. And here's the reason why. Those kids were never lost. They weren't lost. Job would be with those children for all of eternity in paradise in heaven. Those kids aren't lost. Those kids aren't lost. I think it's so precious. Sometimes you meet people, and and I know Ginger and I have met folks like this many times, and and uh, you know we get to we meet them and we get to talking about and 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 several times we've had people say we ask them you know do you have any children? Oh yeah, I have I have two boys and I have I have a girl and then and then I have I have a son in heaven. You get the idea? Yeah, kids, the child's not lost. Just gone to be with the Lord. And, 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 and even though Job had lost his 10 children for the past probably 5,000 years, remember from our timing for the book of Job, for the, for the past 5,000 years, Job has been with those 10 children who died in the storm, plus with the 10 children that God gave him later on. Yeah. God blessed him. God blessed him. By the way, an interesting thing, if you read through this, verse number 14, you, you find that the daughters are mentioned, but not the sons. The, 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 he said, yeah, he had, uh, he had seven sons, had three daughters. Uh, who were those sons? We don't know. But the daughters were told their name. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, in verse number 14, we find their names are given to us. And I think there's a reason for this. First of all, God is showing us their character, their character. You see, one of the daughters was named Jemima, which simply means she's joyful like the light of morning. That's what the name means. Joyful like the light of morning. Uh, Kazia. Kazia was the second daughter. Uh, simply means that she is pleasing like the smell of a garden. Pleasing like the smell of the garden. And then there's Karen Hepbook. Karen Hepbook, a personality that glows like an emerald. Yeah, these were some these were some special young ladies with some great character qualities. And, and so their names, while the boys are ignored, these girls, their names are listed for us. Wonderful character qualities that they had. Not only, not only are his daughters named because or listed here because of their character, but in verse number 15, we find that they're also listed because of their beauty, because of their beauty in all of the land. The Bible says there were no girls more beautiful than the daughters of Job. I mean, these were girls that, you know, all of the guys saw them went, you know, I mean, these are these are good looking young ladies. And uh, and, and so, yeah. And so that more beautiful, more beautiful than all the daughters of, of the land. And, and so they were they were honored because of their character, their beauty. And, and then also we find their standing. Interesting thing. In, in verse number 15, they are given an inheritance with their brothers. Wow. See, that's something that didn't happen in that culture. Uh, the, the girls didn't normally get the inheritance. That always went to the guys. But, but, but Job's daughters, they're actually made to be equal heirs with their brothers. They're, they're given a part of the inheritance. So, so there's, there it is. There, there's the restoration of, of Job's children. But then there's one more that we find here. And of course, that is this, the restoration of his health the restoration of his health. The Bible says in verse 16 and verse number 17, after this, 
lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his son's sons, even four generations. And so Job died being old and full of days. As we said before many times, all of us at some point in our life, at some time or other, we're going to encounter crisis circumstances in our life. They're going to come. They're going to come. And, and, and when it comes, we can respond as Job did. We can respond as Job did in the beginning. Remember in the beginning when all of his troubles first started? Remember we saw how that Job worshipped God. Remember that? Yeah, he did. He, he, he worshipped the Lord God in the beginning. But then later on, later on, as his three friends come along and they start, they start, they start accusing him and, and, and all of those things that were going on. Then we find Job's mind, it, it begins to change and he begins, then he begins to, to find fault with God. Instead of praising God, he finds fault with God and begins to actually come to the conclusion that, well, God's just not fair with me. God, God's not just. God's not doing what is right. But, but then in the end, in the end, after God deals with Job, we find that Job begins to acknowledge his own sin and God's perfect wisdom and God's perfect power. We, we, we can follow those same steps. We can follow those same steps. And so we, may, we also, may we also learn from this final chapter that the Lord God is a liberal rewarder. He is a liberal rewarder of all those who will dare to love him and to trust him and to serve him regardless of the circumstances that we face in life. And so ends the story of Job. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. We pray that you would take these things that we've been able to see together tonight. And we pray, Father, Father that you would help us to learn from it. We pray that you would help us, dear Father, to, uh, to determine that when we do face the difficulties that come into our lives, that we will, that we will be faithful to love you and to serve you, to do and to be what you would have us to do, what you would have us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.